It was 20 years ago this month that the world heard a brand new sound. It came out of Seattle from a band called Nirvana. Never really heard anything quite like it before. Because it took that, it took that rawness of grunge, but then it sort of, it sort of kind of married it with, with kind of traditional rock pop music as we knew it in the production. And I was like, oh yes, yeah, that's, that's, that's going to be big. Charles Peterson, a photographer who documented what would come to be known as grunge or the Seattle sound, created many of the iconic images of that era. I mean, it's one of my favorites from the Raji show. You know, it was a lot of elbows, and I was constantly getting the, you know, the, the flash knocked off of my camera. The, the plastic shoe would break because some stage diver would catch it with it. Peterson's images of the raw physicality of the scene anchor a new exhibit at Seattle's Experience Music Project, which chronicles the influences that led to Nirvana's blistering Nevermind album and the grunge explosion. Grunge really put us on the map for the whole world. Alex Shumway from Green River, Gary Allen May from us. Uh, Jacob McMurray curated the exhibit. Working on this exhibition, I, I had a huge amount of personal pressure to, to get this story right because, you know, it is about grunge, we're in Seattle, it is a, you know, musical form that people care about deeply. The show features dozens of oral histories from musicians and insiders and artifacts like Nirvana lead singer Kurt Cobain's guitars, his cardigan sweater, and even the figurine from the band's last album, In Utero. In addition to the exhibit at EMP, a 20th anniversary box set of Nevermind will go on sale. PBS will air a documentary about Pearl Jam and the influential Seattle band Soundgarden has regrouped and recently released a new album. But what does it mean to a fiercely independent, creative Seattle to put such an anti-establishment scene up on a pedestal? Probably in the, in the, in the mind of Kurt Cobain, if, if he was still, still with us, uh, he would probably think the most punk thing would be to, yeah, just, just reject it all. Cobain committed suicide in 1994, but by then, grunge had become a household term and the inspiration for a feature film and for high fashion. I think that at the height of, you know, the whole grunge hysteria, you know, the city was being bombarded by so many PR requests, so many, you know, people wanting to know the secret language of grunge or wanting to know all the grunge hotspots that, you know, and I think to people in the community, you know, people are just like, why is this a big deal? In 1992, when a reporter for this newspaper asked if there was a secret grunge lingo, Megan Jasper, then working at a record distributor, happily obliged. He asked for a lexicon, and I thought, well, that's ridiculous. Like, of course, there's not really a lexicon. So I thought, I'm just going to have some fun. And I, I expected him to, at some point, just go, oh, come on, and we'd have a good laugh. But the laugh was on the paper, which printed Jasper's made-up terms like harsh realm and lame stain. I kind of figured it would be my 15 minutes, and it's actually been 20-something years, so... Now Jasper is executive vice president of Sub Pop Records, the label that first signed Nirvana. Today, the label's artists, from Mud Honey to Shabazz Palaces, are a reflection of the city's multifaceted music scene. If there is a Seattle sound, it might be the indie folk of bands like Head in the Heart and Fleet Foxes whose sweet harmonies don't exactly inspire stage diving and mosh pits like grunge once did. Yeah, I don't think you really get that with the, what I call beard rock these days. We're all fine bands, but you know, it just doesn't get your, get my heart pumping. But you can still get your heart pumping in Seattle if you know where to go. This is Haunted Horses, a Seattle band playing at an underground all-ages venue called the Black Lodge that looks a lot like the small, dingy spaces where the grunge sound incubated two decades ago. 
But don't go using the G word around these guys. Well, living in Seattle, it has the stigma of being a grunge city, and I think it's definitely outgrown it. It's definitely a very diverse environment, but as for grunge, I think grunge had its day, and it was just kind of a fad for the moment. I don't know. It's sure it's our forebearers. It's it's our it's it's kind of my dad's music. Like I grew up listening to it a lot, but I would definitely <laughs> you are old. <laughs> I definitely um. You know, I think it's still something we'll all turn on and rock out to and have a good time to, but I don't think that what is happening now, what's cool now in Seattle is grunge music.